Okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody who came on time. Uh, as you already might have noticed, I'm recording these lectures. My goal for recording these lectures, including recording it here, I'll tell you in a second as soon as I get the recording going. Okay. Um, so I'm recording these lectures so that I can post them on YouTube. I'm recording an MP3 version so that I can also post them on my website. You can go jogging and listen to the lectures again. But uh, more importantly, I've, I've done this in the past when I was teaching at Berkeley a few years ago and a hundred student class turned into uh, 15 or 20,000 views per lecture, which for me is very useful because I'm trying to help people learn more about economics and in particular in this class about resource economics. So you'll have the opportunity if you want to, to review the lectures on YouTube, maybe. Don't count on it, so take notes, right? But on the other hand, there should be an archive of this on the web at some point during the class. Um, I'm starting a little bit late today. I will start on time in the future. I know it sucks to get up at dark and come over here. I had to come all the way across town and I'm sorry, I'm sure you're sorry, I would have loved to have a 10 o'clock class. So please show up on time. If you come in late, uh, don't make noise, you know, do the normal thing. If you come in earlier, then sit in the middle right now, we're okay. We literally have half the class here today. On exams, I'm sure everybody will be here. So let, this is a class, this is economics, uh, 362. If you're in the wrong class, you now have the opportunity to, to leave. Uh, it's resource economics, and I am, uh, my name is David Zetland, I am uh, going to tell you about me and then go through this list here, uh, but uh, resource economics is very closely related to environmental economics, and we're going to be teaching, uh, we'll be talking about both of those together, basically, in this class. Um, and what I want to do is I'm going to start off with some uh, general economics stuff, including the way that I tend to think about economics, which is uh, every, every lecturer has their own version of that. And then I'm going to go into uh, more complicated problems with economics, as in economics 101 just doesn't work. And then we're going to go into uh, resources and eventually environment. They'll, be, they'll all be intermingled and inter interlinked. I don't necessarily, so let me tell you about me. I'm uh, born and raised in San Francisco, California. I uh, took, uh, I did my undergraduate at UCLA and then I traveled for uh, five years during the 90s uh, to 65 countries, which changed the way I saw the world. Then I came back and did a PhD at UC Davis in the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. My uh, PhD was on, uh, it was called Conflict and Cooperation Inside of an Organization, and it was a case study of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. What that is about is about how water managers are fighting over water in California. Water is a very interesting resource. I specialize in water, uh, and I have a blog called Aguanomics, which I spend a lot of time on. Uh, you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time on, but you will learn more about Aguanomics when we get to the syllabus. So um, I got into the water resources game, and then I did a postdoc at Berkeley on the political economy of natural resources. Political economy meaning more or less the fight over who gets the stuff. And uh, I did that for a couple years, then went to the Netherlands and lived in Amsterdam for three years and worked at a university there called Wageningen University, which is uh, a life sciences university just like uh, Davis and Berkeley. And um, uh, there I was working on EU water policy as well as water policy worldwide. So I've been around. Uh, my girlfriend is actually from Canada. That's why I'm in Vancouver. And I had the great opportunity to teach you guys uh, here. Uh, I'm also teaching another class called 482, which will be a seminar class. I don't think any of you are, are actually probably in both classes, but just so you know, if I say my other class, that'll be a seminar class on, again, natural resources. So, um, and you'll hear plenty more about my economic ideas. Let me hear more about you guys. Uh, you are third year students, is that right? You can make noise, it's okay. Fourth, okay. Represent, all right. Um, economics majors? Any non-economics majors? Minor economics uh, major, political science. Well, you're fine. Okay. Uh, we also allow scientists in here because uh, sometimes we need to have an objective perspective. But economics and uh, political science, they tend to be more subjective end of the spectrum. I wouldn't even call them a science, although some people like that. 
Uh, I say that economics is mathematics with opinions, or opinions with mathematics, uh, and we'll, we'll probably spend some time on that as this class goes on. Uh, how many of you are uh, native or born in Canada? A few. How many are not, or from the, from, let's call it, let's call it Asia, generally speaking? How about not Asia? Okay, somewhere? Tanzania? Tanzania? Turkey. Turkey. Russia. Russia. Other, okay, Asian countries. China? Taiwan? The other part of China? Uh, what else do I have? Japan? Korea? What else? Thailand? Anywhere else I'm missing in Asia? Asia means China right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's fine and that's great because what you'll be doing in this course actually is helping me learn about natural resource and environmental issues in your country, right? I'll get to the syllabus in detail, but you will be writing more than you are used to in an economics class. There will be almost, there will be very little mathematics. The mathematics will be ridiculously easy because I hate doing math, okay? But you'll be doing some briefings. You'll be doing a blog post. You'll be reading each other's briefings and blog posts. You'll, other people on the internet will be reading your blog posts, of course. So in this class, we're going to be talking a lot of how the economics work in practice, in reality, outside with natural resources. And by natural resources, what do we mean? An example. What's an example? What? Water. Good call. Next, another natural resource. Petroleum. Petroleum. Fossil fuels. Another natural resource. What's a natural, what does it mean a natural resource? It's natural, right? Natural. Anything, did you see anything natural today? Hmm? Coal. Coal. Good, yes. That's a natural resource. Uranium, yes. Forestry. Forestry. Trees. Timber, they're called, right? They're not trees, they're timber. Give me one. You. Gas. Huh? Gas. gas. The kind that is the natural kind, not the unnatural gas. In the back, yes. Water. Water. I already heard that. That's a good one, though. Ice. We'll call that ice. Natural resource. You, in the green. Uh, clean air. Clean air. That's an interesting one. But it is in that broader category of something that we like to have around, right? Because dirty air is not so good, right? I saw photos. China has got some interesting dirty air situation going on with the smog. Like smog in the airport that you can't see the other end of the terminal inside the building. That was, like if I couldn't see you right now because of smog, that would be a lot of smog, right? So managing resources actually, uh, to get to what you said, links to managing the environment. Right? If you don't manage your coal, then you're going to have a problem with your clean air. Right? And that's what we're going to talk about in this class. That's just an overview. So, um, I am not, I don't like to lecture. I like to teach. There are two words here. Lecturing means I stand here and I talk to you and you write it down. And when I ask you a question, you write down what you wrote down. You don't actually think. Okay? Teaching means that I ask you questions or you ask me questions, those are the best ones, and then in the process of essentially not understanding, at some point you get to understanding. All right? What that means is we're going to go through a lot of things, a lot of examples. It, not, it may not make sense to you because it may not make sense to me. I'm sorry. I'm not a very linear thinker sometimes. So things will come up and they will come up again and in a different way from a different angle. And your job is to say, number one, I don't understand. That means raise your hand. Okay, everybody raise your hand. You too, yes. Too tired to wake up. Now raise the other hand. Okay, now you're ambidextrous, okay? You can use either hand to ask me a question. I will try to talk, I will try to give il illustrations, but I really need you to tell me, I don't get it, or what about this, or I was thinking about this, or what about that article. All those things are fine. My job during this semester, I'm gonna call it a semester. Do you call it a semester? Okay, my job, term, trimester, whatever the hell it is, my job is to teach you, okay? My job is not to come in he out here and read to you, which is very boring for both of us. All right, 
Now, the problem with that, of course, is that I don't necessarily have the greatest structure in the world. I don't have typed PowerPoints where you can just like, oh, I didn't meet, go to the lecture, I'll just look at the PowerPoint. No, you're going to actually have to participate and think and use the paper and pencil. And if you got the email, who got the email from me yesterday? Great. So those of you who are using paper obviously either got the email or love paper. But the point of, of not using computers in the class is on the one hand, the noise. On the other hand, people using Facebook who are really not paying attention to the class. And if you need to use Facebook, there's a door there and a door there, okay? So just go outside or do it during the break, and we will take a break, by the way. But taking notes with paper, I'm suggesting that as a way to, to take notes, and I'm sorry for people who are, are, have bad handwriting. Mine is terrible, so uh, I know what you're up for. Um, now, uh, part of the problem that students have with a random professor or someone who talks about lots of things not necessarily in order is they worry about their grade. Now the good news is I'm in charge of your grade so I get to adjust for my uh, moving around in terms of what you get in your grade. More importantly the Department of Economics has a curve. Everybody's aware of this? Okay, so you're going to be in the curve anyway. So no matter what I do to you, if you do well, you'll get an A, and if you do badly, you'll get a D. So don't worry about that, all right? And I'll be very, very clear, I'm going to try, I'm, and I try to be very fair on grading. So I, I have run into this before, you know, you all want to get good grades, I totally agree. I also want you to learn. Learning and grades should be the same thing. I'm trying to align those two things, so that if you learn a lot, you'll get a good grade. In my other class, the final exam is going to be an oral exam. I'm, actually, I'm just going to talk to them. And if they get it, then it'll be good. If they don't get it, they'll get a bad grade. Right? So in this class, there's 90 of you. Bad news for the oral exam. Good news for written exam. But the whole point is that you have to be clear. And don't worry about being clear and saying very little when it comes to writing what comes up next. Okay? You don't have to write 5,000 words of crap. And you can, if you can write a thousand words that's useful, all right? So in that sense, if you have the exam and it's a three-word answer, write the three words, go on. Don't make my life terrible reading stuff called I don't know. If you don't know, I don't know is a great answer, okay? If you make up a better answer than I don't know, like a nice story, I might give you points just because it's entertaining, okay? But don't give me the wrong answer and bullshit me. Or the TA, who will be here on Thursday. All right. Uh, I'm terrible at, learning, at remembering or learning people's names, so sorry in advance. I'll point at you and then you'll be like, okay, I'm the guy in the green shirt. You can change your, your jumper, by the way. Um, and, uh, and that's that. Let me see, so speaking of the syllabus, let me point past these out here so we can go over the syllabus because that tends to give a nice map for the class. Spread those that way. You guys can do that. You can you just drop your coffee. More. I'll go the other way. Okay, you can pass forward. Okay, number one, this is a this syllabus is is uh, a draft. It's not going to be the last syllabus, but it's going to be more or less the same. I will uh, post a PDF of the syllabus online so you can have a copy of it. And I don't, I will not be bringing very much printed matter into the class after today. We're doing, how's the spreading going on there? Who's lacking? Everybody got them here? Everybody got one? One more. Awesome. Who's missing? Can you pass that this way? Everybody has a syllabus. Okay. So, I'm David. I put my, my, my email address is dzetland at gmail or dzetland at sfu. I don't care. It'll get to me. Uh, my cell phone, in case you need to reach me, uh, I don't know when that will be, but if you have too much pizza or too much beer, you can call me up and say, you know, we have a problem here. Um, my office hours are going to be on Tuesdays and Thursdays be, uh, after this class, uh, and so um, if you need office hours out of that time, I'm going to be on campus Tuesday and Thursday, but if you need office hours, uh, office hours out of that time, tell me. Sometimes you don't need office hours, you just want to send an email, send an email. Send a question, I'm usually, within a day, I will reply. I'm very, very crazy about emails. Um, Hossein will come on uh, Thursday and, and wave. He's basically a grader. There is no discussion section in this class, so in that sense, our discussion will be here. Um, 
Now, class times, lecture, lecture, first lecture. The reading break I have here as that Tuesday through Saturday. Okay? If anybody sees errors on this, tell me and I'll, and I'll make corrections. Uh, the last lecture should be the, the 8th of April. Uh, the final exam is the 13th of April, Sunday at 3.30, which is probably, I don't know, the worst possible time. Maybe Monday at 8.30 is the worst possible time. But anyway, that apparently is the final. Is it in this room? Is that normal? I need to find out. Okay, I'll find out. Now, technology. Uh, there are readings that are posted on Canvas, and have, has anybody clicked through? Are you all accessing Canvas successfully? Okay, great. Um, I've never used it before, so I don't know sometimes your perspective versus my perspective. Um, I'll get to the readings in a minute. I got the laptop thing. Uh, phones, same game. Seriously, like just wait for the break. Like the world can wait for 50 minutes, okay? Uh, if, it, if it rings, just turn it off, don't answer the phone. Unless it's your mother and your dad's in the hospital, okay? I, you can get up and leave. I don't care, but just don't talk in class. Lecture videos I just mentioned. All right, now, assignments. Here's the overview of what we'll be doing. In fact, what I'll be asking you to do in the class. There'll be four homework assignments. The first one, actually, I'll give you next lecture on Thursday. It'll be due in a week. That's going to be normal, okay? Uh, the, the, the homework is probably going to be I might, I might actually just post it online and then you can bring a hard copy, okay? So we'll go through, uh, each homework might be different, but just count on it online, bring it in a week later. All assignments are due at the start of class here, for example, okay? Don't come in at 8.35 and expect me to take your homework. That's a zero. You can email it in ahead of that, that's fine too. I don't like late at all. The briefings. The briefings are very uh, unusual for undergrads, so let's go over those for a second. There'll be two different briefings. A briefing is about two pages long. That's a thousand words, uh, which is single space, by the way. Uh, 6,000 characters in 12 point. You know, if you want to Mickey Mouse with the margins and all that stuff, go ahead, but please don't, you know, you're, you're going to be grading each other, by the way. So if someone, if someone hands in, so here's what, I'm, here's what I'm getting at. If someone does a briefing on two pages, and it's nice, and it, and it reads well, and it makes a point, that's great. If someone has got the margins down to like half a centimeter, and they're at eight point type or whatever, when you are grading them, which is what you'll be doing, this is pure grading, you can give them a terrible grade. That's fine by me. That's part of your job, okay? That's called not doing what you've been told to do. So take a reasonable amount of space to make your point. Don't get crazy about the fonts and the margins and all that stuff, okay? That's like really high school stuff, but I, I've seen it happen in Berkeley. So, hopefully you guys are better than Berkeley. Length, that's the length. Turn the page. Got nothing on the other side. Um, okay, you will bring three copies of the briefing, all right? You will not put your name on the upper right corner at all. There is no identifying information. You will be anonymous, okay? You'll put the last four digits of your SFU ID as your name, okay? Three copies, your ID will be on the upper right corner. Is that clear enough? If you don't have three copies, a zero. If you, don't have, if you have your name on it, a zero. If you don't have your four digits on it, a zero. Okay? Please do that. That's what I mean. Now, the grading is going to be interesting. What's going to happen is everybody's going to bring in three copies. Then we're going to do some Mickey Mouse stuff over here in the corner. And then you're going to walk out with three, three copies. You'll have three briefings from other people in the class. And you'll have three different briefings from other people in the class, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to go home and do two things. You're going to read all the briefings and comment on them critically in terms of how good they are, the use of language, making your point, etc. I'll get to the content, by the way, in a minute. You're going to comment on how good they are, and then you're also going to... So that'll be written, and you'll have your four-digit number on there, right? I'm, I'm 2645, writing for 5265, all right? This is the future right now. We're doing number. You, you are not a person anymore. You're a number. And then you're going to rank order them. In that sense, first, second, first place, second place, third place. Okay, you're not assigning 8 out of 10. You're not assigning 6.5. You're not taking off one for spelling. This is, of the three I have, this is the best one. This is the second best one. This is the third best one. Okay? That's what you're going to do. And everybody in the class will be doing that for three different briefings. And then this whole mess is going to come back to me, and we're going to collate it out and distribute it back to the original authors, who then get to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down 
to the feedback you just gave them. So that's complicated, but what we're trying to do is make it easy to do a good job and be rewarded and easy to punish a bad job or, relatively speaking, a bad job. So that means you bring in three copies. I'm going to give a copy to him and to him and to her. They're gonna, she's going to write up what she thinks about it. He's going to write up what he thinks about it. He's going to write up what he thinks about it. And she's going to give you a gold. He's going to give you a silver. And he's going to give you a bronze. That's all going to come back. That'll be your grade. Then you're going to grade them, gold, silver, bronze, or whatever, on, based on the quality of their feedback. Okay? Now, I wrote something here about you choose whether to be corrupt or honest. So that means if someone gives you a gold, you can give them a gold too because I love you too, right? But if they give you crap feedback and someone else gives you better feedback who gives you a bronze or a silver, which is often the case, that it's okay to give them your best feedback score, right? This person gave me the best feedback because what did they do? They helped you improve. Someone who just tells you how great you are you know, that's your mom's job, right? So in the class, we're trying to be more critical. We're trying to learn something. And the big thing that you'll see, number one, uh, is that, be, so the, the, what's the first thing that's going to happen when you're doing this, when you're writing it? Tell me about the psychology of the student who's typing a briefing, knowing that other students are going to be reading that. Is that different to you than when you submit it to me? No? Could be. But maybe when you're typing this thing at home, typing, by the way, no writing, no handwritten, you will start thinking, who is my audience? Who are these people with me? And can I explain it clearly to them? I have run into the past, and I know as a student myself, there is such a thing as called bullshitting the professor. If we hand in 90 15-page papers, do you think he's really going to read it all? And in fact, they don't do that anymore. They have uh, computers grading essays, right? Computers are grading essays just as well as humans because they just look for the keywords, which is what we do also. Unfortunately for you, you're going to be reading each other's essays, and you already know each other's tricks and bullshit. So now you'll know if you're doing a good job or not. And that's going to be great because you're going you're to do a good job, and it's only two pages, so don't worry about it. The other thing that you'll see in terms of the feedback and so on is that we're going to do it again. There'll be two briefings. So the second time around, you'll probably be better at it because you're used to it. And guess what? If you're good at doing briefings, you can do a whole career of briefings, like literally years, because it's very difficult for people in this world to do a good job summarizing an idea for somebody else. Most of the time, they write, you know, there's this joke, I'm sorry, my lecture is going to be 90 minutes today. I didn't have time to get it down to 10, right? If you can get to your point, then you can say something clearly and concisely, and that is a very, very valuable skill, right? It's a skill because it takes a lot of practice. And I'm sorry about that, but the good news is you get to practice in this class. Uh, the bad news is it'll be part of your grade, but we're all part of the same game, right? And then later on, you might turn this into a part of your career. I'm not even kidding. This is what I, this is what I spend a lot of time on when I do consulting. Okay, um, that's the briefing. There's two of them. The topic of the briefing is the big question. The t I'll come up with the topic of the briefing in the course of doing the, 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 the class so that we come up with something. It might be you know, oil pipelines in British Columbia. It could be uh, uh, pollution control in China. Who knows what it's going to be? All right? It'll, probably, it'll, it'll probably, probably will be one topic so that everybody's writing about the same thing. Okay? Another thing that I like in the briefing is State the problem, state the cause, state the impacts, state a solution or a potential solution, right? And sometimes the solution could be, oh, don't drive cars in Beijing. Well, that is a solution. I'm not sure how realistic that is. So you also need to be realistic about your solution. And what I have found by asking classes of students to solve very difficult problems is they come up with really interesting, and I mean useful, interesting answers. This is how I learn. This is why I teach. I could listen to myself talk all day, but I'm going to listen to you guys. That's what I want from you. So that's what we'll be, we'll be doing on the briefings. We'll try and find a very difficult problem so you can talk about it in two pages. Solve it, by the way. Okay. Uh, there'll be a midterm. Uh, blog post. The blog post is 1.4.2. We'll be on anything that includes natural resource and, environmental, and or environmental economics as a central theme. Yes to the impact of cars on health or pollution. No to your awesome car stereo. Okay? It's going to be about economics, please. Uh, 
I'll post two to three. So you're going to give me on email all of your briefings by whatever the deadline is, March 7th or 6th or something like that? March 6th. You will email it to me on or before March 6th. I will post them, all of them, on my blog, Aguanomics, in the subsequent days. There's, if there are 90, and I'm hoping, if, if there's 45, we're great. But if there's 90, they're all, gonna, they're all gonna go up before the end of the semester. And it'll have, as a default, your name and photo. Because I have found that people who are reading blog posts like to know what the person looks like who's writing it. It doesn't make any sense, but they like it. It's like I'm talking to you, you're talking to me, right? Okay. So if you don't want your name or your photo or both posted, then I will just put your initials because we need to identify you internally, okay? So that's a question of privacy, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I think photos are posted because your student profiles, right? Can I get those easily? I'm not going to take photos of everybody. Are they posted online photos? No? Okay, forget the photo. Well, if I can find it, I can. I'm not, otherwise, no. So anyway, your name and, uh, uh, and you'll have your post. And, it's, and I, I wrote two or three hundred words is what I want you to write here in terms of, that's like a page of normal size type, okay? And what you're going to do is you're going to choose a topic of your own interest. You're going to talk about it. It doesn't have to be an essay. It's 200 words, okay? You talk about the things that are interesting about it. Um, la, 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 content, format. Highlight, okay, content. Highlight an issue, diagnose its cause, slash impacts, and suggest a solution, okay? I don't like that my roommates don't flush the toilet. It's caused by roommates not pressing the lever, and it smells. I'm going to fix this problem by whatever, shooting my roommate, okay? That's easy. It's only 50 words, you made your point. So you can do it on any topic you want uh, and uh, you'll submit it to me by that date. And then you have only one more obligation, which is that uh, you should, you, you should, you shall, you shall comment on at least one other post by another student. I don't care if it's your friend, I don't care if it's someone you've ever met, I don't care if you're commenting because they have a spelling error, I want you to leave a comment. The reason I want you to do that is because I want you to engage in the concept of a dialogue in public. Right? This is not you and your friends text messaging, it is a little bit more than just like your Facebook wall, but it's discussing things in public, ideas in public. And your job is going to be to say something useful. All right? It doesn't have to be that sophisticated, just say something useful. And that's just going to be a little check. If you do it, you get a check. If you don't do it, you lose like a couple points off your grade, okay? So uh, that's going to be the feedback, and that'll be by the end of the semester. I'll have some kind of deadline. Um, and if, you, if, you, if someone replies on your blog post, you can reply or not. It doesn't matter. There's lots of different ways of thinking about it. Uh, there was one in the past. I did this at Berkeley. There was one student who was abused by a commentator and I uh, did my best to take that person apart as a fucking idiot, okay? So your job is not to worry about the fucking idiots. That's my job. Your job is to write something useful, okay? If you say something stupid and someone says, that's stupid, that's your fault, okay? But idiots are my problem, so don't worry about that. And besides that, I removed their comment. Um, okay, any questions about the briefing or the blog posts right now. <coughs> okay, any questions? Of, uh, there's no questions on the homework or the final because we haven't even written that, so that's pretty much going to be straightforward. Have I, have I, does this make sense to you in terms of the way classes should be graded or structured? I know there's some unusual stuff in there, but I'm new to SFU. Is anything unusual in what I'm doing that doesn't make sense or there will be problems? Looks okay, acceptable, reasonable? Reasonable. I want reasonable. Reasonable? Okay. Okay, great. Um, now, the reading. I'm going to keep going through the syllabus just so you have an outline. Um, and as I mentioned for you, especially for, for people who came in late, by the way. Okay, who's missing a syllabus? You are. Two, three... 
pass that back to her. Pass the other one back to her. Yeah, it's coming. Okay? All right. Um, so as I mentioned, number one, for people who came in late, I'm starting at 8.30, and if you're late, you're late. Don't make any noise. Uh, number two, we're not doing computer stuff. Number three, uh, this is a, a draft syllabus. It might change a little bit, but it's, it's you know, most of the stuff is, is more or less firm in here. Um, readings. Okay, so uh, again, the ones with the asterisks in front of them, I've posted on Canvas, so you can download it. Uh, I might, I, I am almost surely going to come up with more things for you to read. It will not necessarily, the things that I, that I come up with won't necessarily uh, be long. They will be usually topical. Um, so what do we have here? The text. Who has bought the book? Successfully. Okay, good. Three or four people. Those of you who have not bought the book, you should probably buy the book. Is it, is it in the store? Yes, good. Okay. It costs $28. This is the cheapest economics textbook you'll ever have. Okay? You could buy 10 of them and you're still saving money. Okay? So, um, I might get Ed in to actually talk. He actually lives over the border in Washington. Uh, but I might, I probably won't because now he's in Wisconsin like chasing ice balls or something like that. So, um, I don't like the subtitle, A Libertarian Perspective on the Environmental, whatever the hell it is. I happen to have liber libertarian interests or liberal interests in terms of politics, but the book is very clear in terms of discussing mostly environmental economics. Uh, he also, by definition, gets into resource economics, and he talks often about how our mismanagement of resources leads to environmental problems. All right? This is a guy who will tell you that we should price carbon if we want to do something about climate change or, or mitigation, mitigation of, of uh, GHG uh, gas emissions. So um, it's a very easy book to read. Uh, you, should, you should, if you're interested in starting now, the, the introduction and the first chapter are very appropriate for these next couple weeks. You can read those. Uh, I will ask essay questions out of the book on the midterm and on the final. That is your motivation to read the book. Okay? And if you fuck around with your answers, you'll get a zero because I'll, I'll know you didn't read the book. All right? That's that simple. Now, uh, for a more complicated version of what he talks about, and sorry about swearing, by the way, I use it as an adjective. It doesn't mean that I hate you. It means I just have more energy than I, I should. I haven't even had any coffee. So, um, Hayek is mentioned in that paragraph there. This is a required reading. The Use of Knowledge in Society is a fairly deep essay or a fairly simple essay, depending on how you look at it. It's deep in the sense that he talks about the way that prices coordinate behavior among the seven billion plus people on the planet today. Right? You go get your cup of coffee, you don't know where it came from, you, the farmer doesn't know who you are, who's, I just was in, 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 in Colombia where they grow, these guys are growing coffee, they don't know you, you don't know them, but somehow you manage to work together. That is through this crazy thing called prices, right? The farmer does not, as Adam Smith said, the farmer does not, or the, 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 the butcher and the baker do not wake up in the morning, the baker does not wake up in the morning to bake you bread because he likes you. Your mother does that. Your bo the baker wakes up in the morning because he wants to make some money, and you have got money for the bread, right? So you change one for the other, and that's how the basics of economics uh, work. And the thing that's magical about the price system is that if, there's, if all of you show up to get a cappuccino, the Starbucks guys say, holy cow, we can sell cappuccinos for $8, and the price goes up. And half of you leave because you'd rather drink tea or drink water or whatever, and the price system rations goods as well. When it comes to resources, the rationing dimension of pricing is very significant. It's extremely important. That is why we do have electricity almost all the time, and is also why we have lots of water shortages or we have lots of uh, problems with environmental pollution. The pricing is not matching the reality. Okay? That is as central a theme as we're going to get in this class. How do we get prices right? And by the way, sometimes prices don't work, right? Regulation has its place. It is very useful. Self-constraint, self-control, religion have their places. Peer pressure, right? I just heard, talked to a guy. Uh, he's like, yeah, what's up with this water stuff? My girlfriend really hated that I was running the tap while I was brushing my teeth, and now I turned it off, and now she loves me. 
Now that's a great feedback loop, right? You get love if you turn off the faucet when you're brushing your teeth, right? So, that's, so that had nothing to do with prices. That was a, a bit of a, a inter-household uh, negotiation. So that kind of topic will come up a lot. And, I'll be ta and, and by the way, so let me repeat what I said very briefly earlier. I'm going to talk through a lot of economics in the first couple weeks because the, the, the rest of the syllabus, switch it over for a second, the flip side, the lectures here, as you can see, it's just, a, it's just a, an over, overview, a structure. We've got forest, fisheries, coal, oil, gas, uranium, land, water, wind, solar, hydro. I'm going to do, we're going to do like essentially one theme per week on this topic of resources. I don't have a really great idea about how to talk about it, and we might get through it faster than not. But what I want you to do, I'm, just, I'm skipping ahead to this because this is very important. What I, when, if we're talking about forests, I would really appreciate it if you think about forests before the lecture. And when I say in the second half of the Tuesday class, hey, let's have a, talk, a discussion about forestry or whatever, then you make a comment or ask a question or add a resource, right? This part of the discussion among us will be very helpful because what I want to do, and I haven't done this before, so it's a little bit new, uh, well, I haven't done it in a class before, but I've done it a lot, is I want to have a discussion around the topic of forests or forestry or timber or any of the other resources or the other environmental things that goes, that covers the topic completely from all different directions of economics, okay? and politics and society, right? I don't care about the growth rate of trees from a biological perspective, but I want to have that conversation so that we can uh, understand the economics of forestry. The next week, the economics of oil, gas, whatever, the economics of mining, instead of what you're used to potentially of, today we're going to learn about elasticities, and tomorrow we're going to do the uh, uh, supply curve for a monopolistic firm. Those concepts are, are basic and useful concepts. I'll be reviewing them in the next couple of weeks. But we need to apply them to understand how they work and more importantly how they don't work. Right? What are we missing from this question is going to be uh, probably the number one problem when we're talking about these economics. So that's why I'm organize, organizing this around themes. I need you to prep for that in terms of just being curious. Okay? Put on your hat called I'm learning. No phones please. Did you hear what I said before? No, you, her. Did you, excuse me, did you hear what I said before? Yes. Why were you on your phone? Okay. It's distracting to me. Okay, if you need to do it, you can go out. There is an interesting trend, and I'm older than you. There's an interesting trend that people older than me tell me, right? It's about FaceTime. It's about being with people, listening to people, and understanding people. There was a word from the 1970s. Nobody here was born in the 70s. Nobody probably was born in the 80s? Born in the 80s, anyone? The old guys, yeah. 90s? You're the 90s kids, right? the digital generation, the digits, the thumb, people with thumb problems. There are always going to be issues of communicating among people. Don't make it worse by not communicating with people. All right? There's appropriate technology for appropriate time. I'm sorry to embarrass you. And we can do email when we do email, we do talk when we do talk. Okay? We only have an hour, uh, uh, around three hours, three uh, class hours per week. Right? And how many classes are you taking more than this? Three or four? Five? How many? Three, Three more? So four total? Yeah. Okay. So you're getting 12 hours of instruction, 12, 15 hours of instruction, right? Now the other uh, 150 hours a week, some of it you're sleeping, some of it you're you know, doing your laundry, some of it you're hanging out with your friends, but part of it is thinking about what's going on. Right? What's going on in your classes? If you're lucky, what's going on and the classes are touching on each other. Right? Oh, I'm taking economics and I'm taking history of Europe and I'm taking uh, you know, transportation engineering. All those things do end up fitting together in some way. The world fits together in a way. 
Our conversations are part of that discussion. The reason that I am here talking to you live is because I am better than a book, or I'm hoping to be better than a book, right? If, if you can learn all this by reading a book, then you don't need me, fine. I got no problem with that. But what I want to do is I want to be able to have this discussion and be able to give you something in terms of a perspective, but also for you to ask me back, right? And that takes attention, and that takes time, but it doesn't take that much. So I'm only asking for your time and your attention for about three hours a week. Okay, lectures. We're going to follow through on these themes. There is going to be significant overlap. When we do fossil fuels, yes, we'll talk about pollution and climate change and so on, but then we'll go on to the module on climate change later on. If it goes out of order, don't worry about it. I'm not worried about it. You only have to worry about it if I'm worried about it, but I'm not going to be because it'll be on your, on your exam the way we talked about it anyway. So don't worry about it. Um, and I'm also open to suggestions called, what about this resource or what about this environmental issue? Because I can switch that up and put those things in. So if you have ideas, I am the person to give ideas to. I love ideas. I get random emails from people all the time because of my blog. I've been running it for five years. And people send me the most interesting and random and sometimes totally useless emails. But I like that. I'm used to it. Don't worry. You can't even get as bad as I've seen, right? So send me an email if you have an idea. That's fine. Back to the reading, sorry. Um, okay, so uh, Gordon, so who's heard of a tr the tragedy of the commons? That expression, tragedy of the commons. Who's heard of it? Who wants to give an explanation for what it is? Who's eager about that one? What does it mean, a tragedy of the commons? Lack of property rights on common property resources can lead to over extraction. Over extraction, okay, so the tragedy is, and, and it refers to, this is, so this, this is a very important concept for the class and resources environment. And it's, and it's important um, many, many ways. So here's, here's what we have. We have a commons with a bunch of houses around it. Okay? And the, so the historic, the historic example is this. And everybody puts their sheep. This is my illustration skills. That's a sheep, okay? So everybody puts their sheep to graze on the area that is owned by everybody or owned by nobody. Okay? It's a commons. And you put one sheep on there, there's enough grass. Two sheep, there's enough grass. 12, 13, 17, 122 sheep, there's just not enough grass. The tragedy is that the individuals who say, oh, I get a benefit from putting my sheep on here, and the cost goes to everybody. That is the logic. I get the benefit, the cost is to everybody. They say, oh, I'll put on a sheep. And then the next door neighbor says, hey, you know what? If I put a sheep, I get a benefit, and the cost goes to everybody. And eventually, everybody puts their sheep to the point where the sheep destroy the commons, so there's no benefit for anybody. Okay? So the tragedy of the commons refers to the problem of a common resource, or what's called a common pool resource sometimes, which we will get to. And that it can be destroyed for lack of property rights, for lack of management. Now the thing that's funny, we'll read the paper on this, Hardin 1968 is the name of the paper. The thing that's funny, funny is, is that, uh, or, or the thing that people point out is like, oh, Tragedy of the Commons, you should read Hardin. Of course there's a paper that came before that from an economist, and of course there's a hundred years before, I'm sure some dude walked outside and said there's too many sheep on the field. This is not, you know, remember the thing is that economists don't discover stuff. Right? Mathematicians discover stuff. Physicists and biologists discover stuff. Economists just write things down. And you get credit for it if you write it down and you put a date on it and you publish it somewhere in a journal. Right? But the person who wrote this down, who actually wasn't an economist, wrote it in 1968, but an economist wrote about the tragedy of the commons as far as fisheries are concerned in 1954. I put that on there because fisheries are a resource, so this is central to the class, but also it's a big yay for the economist because we talked about it before this guy Hardin did. The joke about the tragedy of the commons is there aren't necessarily very many of these situations. Right? Someone went back, someone who asked this question called, hey, whatever happened in history in the commons? What happened when we go back and look at villages where they have sheep? Do they have a tragedy of the commons? And it turns out they usually don't. And they don't have property rights, necessarily, right? But why don't 
these people in their village have a, have a tragedy. And, I'll, and, and before you answer that, how many people live with roommates? Roommates, a few, parents, a few, live on their own. Oh, interesting, okay. So who, ha oh sorry, let's do it a different way. Who has lived with a roommate in the past? Who's lived in a dorm or any kind of com areas where you share stuff? Come on, somebody, all right, all right, all right. So think of your commons. Think of the microwave. Think of the, the sink. Think of the dishes in the sink, right? How do you resolve those commons, right? Do you rent dishes to your roommates? Does, does someone have a job called dish cleaner? How did you clean it? How did you manage that, the commons? I'm listening now. Turns. What? Turns. Take turns. Take turns, one thing. I'll clean up the dishes on Tuesday, you clean up the dishes on Wednesday. I don't know if this is a good solution, but I move out. You move out. Yeah. That's good. No, that's like, you guys can't fix your problem, I'm out of here. No, this is a good idea. It's called, um, uh, what's the name of the book? It's, uh, there's, um, I can't remember it. One, it's, it's, it's to, you, either, you either leave it, or you uh, talk, you, may, you argue with it, yeah. uh, or you, or you uh, whatever, kill people. So that's good, you did the right thing. Another solution. Negotiation. Negotiation. Dude, your dishes, they're dirty, right? Clean your dishes, right? Talk it out, though. Other solutions. I room with an economist, so we just specialize. In how did, how, what did you specialize in? I did dishes better than you. Okay. So you had gains from trade. Okay, very, very good. Uh, I always wash it, so I wash it, and that dish is for you, so you wash it. You wash your own dishes, right? You take care of your own mess. All of those solutions are commons type solutions, but they don't necessarily, um, let's say it this way, fit into an economic model very easily. Okay? So when it comes down to resolving issues with resources or environment, we're going to go a little bit broader than simple price mechanisms or property rights. And even worse, we're going to go into things like culture. What does culture mean? Culture means you do your dishes, apparently. Okay? So we're going to talk about those things because they are effective in getting the job done. And what we want here is this very big idea called sustainability, not necessarily only environmental sustainability because we ride our bikes around, but also sustainability called our society will continue, right? Our children will live. This kind of sustainability and growth, which is really what it's all about in terms of having good policies, good economics, good uh, uh, ways of, of working with each other. All right, looks like I'm running out of time in a minute. Um, let me go through the um, last few things, then we'll take a break. Okay. Um, Ronald Coe's problem of social costs is directly uh, addressing this question of, of pollution. Someone's being polluted, someone is polluting, how can they make a deal? We'll read that and talk about it. Uh, Ostrom et al. Ostrom is the second author in that number two there. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom uh, is one of my big uh, heroes as far as uh, resources and environment are concerned. She recently died. Uh, her husband uh, wrote a book that uh, I used for my dissertation back in 1955. He wrote this about water management in Southern California. She was a political scientist, but she won a Nobel Prize in economics, which if, if you know about that is not really a Nobel Prize, but whatever. And Ostrom was the person who basically got famous for going to the villages and asking people, how do you handle this problem, right? And she said, wow, people have got all kinds of new ideas instead of just property rights or prices. So we'll talk about her a lot, that idea a lot in this class. Optional reading, uh, economics in one lesson. Seriously, if you have to put a book on the back of your toilet and you're just gonna read through it and learn about economics, or you wanna give it to somebody who hates the idea of economics but they can learn it, this is a great book. Um, it was written in 1946, which means that you actually probably will be able to read it. There's no math in it, there's no graphs. He just talks about how people work together, how people behave, but it's a very nice, um, uh, way of understanding economics that I recommend. It's optional. There will be no exam questions. This is only for your own benefit. Um, I have my own self here. Uh, ec economists owe ecology and apology. Again, optional. This is basically on some of the abuses of, uh, uh, have resulted, the, some of the abuses that have resulted because of uh, using certain economic ideas. GDP, for example. 
Uh, and I'll talk about that during the class anyway. You don't have to read it, but if you feel like it, you can read that. So uh, let's take a break now for 10 minutes. All right, let's get started and again. All right, I want to talk a little bit about, um, as I mentioned before, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some basic economics. You have taken, how many people have taken one economics course? One economics course. Oh, sorry, more than one economics course. Yeah. All right, good. That's good news. Okay. Uh, but if you've taken one, you're okay. Don't worry about it. That's like, one. Um, I find that uh, sometimes you go through a course and you might do a bunch of math and so on and then you actually uh, leave and, and it's known as walking out the room and the, and the door scrapes all the knowledge off your head after the final, right? And so sometimes it's good to, to go over these uh, issues again. I actually wrote a paper about demand curves. What goes here? Price. What goes here? Quantity. And a demand curve, uh, it's strange. Do you go to a, a store and say, I'm going to buy uh, you know, uh, a dozen eggs, and then they say, oh, the price for a dozen eggs is uh, $2.99. And you buy, well, I'll buy uh, two dozen eggs. Oh, the price for two dozen eggs is $5. Do you ever, like, do you ever go to the store and, and you look at how much you want, and then because of that, you find out what the price is? Or do you actually kind of go to the store and say, well, that coffee is $5.99, that coffee is $6.99. I don't know, this is cheaper. I don't know if that's better. Because what you tend, tend to do is you say, okay, I want something, but then you look at the price and then you make a decision, right? That's why this is actually called an inverse demand curve, right? It's actually inverted. And guess what? The magic, if you put P down here and Q up here, this is the amazing difference. It's not any different, but it's handy for economists to use this one. It's a long story, I won't bore you with it, but it's handy for them, right? Unfortunately, it's not handy for students. Students actually have a really hard time manipulating demand curves. I won't do this to you, uh, unless I do on the homework. But anyway, they have a hard time manipulating demand curves because if you have to aggregate demand curves, this is a real pain in the ass when you add more demand curves together to do the math correctly. Just trust me. So. The reason I'm giving this example is because I want to go over some economics. If you've heard it before, like the keyword, like elasticity, don't turn off your brain. Okay? Keep listening. Let's see if we can put it in more context so you can have it uh, be useful. So on that note, and as my general uh, caution on the use of mathematics and economics, we will note that this is a fairly clear relationship. We understand that from mathematics. It's dead simple. If, you, if I go and I give you this lecture and I say 1 plus 1 is 2, I will have convinced you that 1 plus 1 is 2. Now, if you have a woman and you have a man, the other question really is, is that relationship true? If you put a woman and a man, heterosexual together, will you get love? Sometimes, of course, is the answer. And this is much more about economics than this. Economics is about how people interact and relate, right? If you tell someone, you're not optimizing, you should do something different, and they say, no, this is what I want to do, they are right, okay? And what happens is sometimes, and this is my, like, I, this is a massive critique behind this, but sometimes people use too much math and economics to prove things that actually don't necessarily turn out to be true. I don't want to do that method. I'm going to a lecture, I probably go to a paper this guy is doing later today about the geographic impact of climate change on economies, right? So basically the spatial impact of climate change. And he has a model and he has a calibration, and he has data, and he makes an assumption. And one of the assumptions is, is that climate change is only going to increase the temperature as an impact, which, as far as Canadians are concerned, is awesome, right? So Canada is going to become a red wine producer, an agricultural powerhouse. There will be, you know, sunshine all the time. It will be like Mexico and Canada, right? That's what it says in the model, but the model leaves out a thing called bad weather. 
right? Because it's the fluctuations in, in weather that are the problem of climate change. But the model leaves that out. So he gets to the end of this thing and says, I conclude that this is going to be this and this is going to be that. All the food is going to move to the North Pole, apparently, which of course doesn't exist because the North Pole is melting, right? There's no ice there. There's no, so there's like, it's going to be, we're going to be having rafts of, of food in the North Sea for our future, according to this model. And if you take your math too seriously, sometimes you say silly things. And what I'm going to say here is, if it doesn't make sense to you because you as a human don't like that idea, that's a good way, reason to object. It doesn't mean that you win the argument, however. You have to have economic reasons or sensible or logical reasons or even philosophical reasons why you do or don't like that thing. So don't see the math as the end of the discussion. See the math as a way of illustrating what we're trying to say. Okay? So uh, that said, I will use some math during this class and you can use it too, but we want to be very clear that we're talking about uh, why people do things and the impacts of what they do and then what happens is the expression, right? I go to the store, I have money in my hands, there's someone behind the counter, and then what happens? We make a trade, right? Or the cash machine is broken, this happened to be at the store yesterday, I have all these apples, I don't have any cash, I don't make a trade, right? So that's what happens, it depends on the circumstances. So that's a big thing about economics that I want to bring up in these, in, these head, in, these, in these big headings. Oh, but let me back up to an old guy, an old white guy, old dead white guy, Aristotle said, and this is not necessarily, you know, uh, a big deal, but he says, look, we have to think about ethics first. What is the good life? Then we have to think about economics. What can we do with what we've got to get that good life? And then we go to politics. How are we going to organize our society to get those, to turn those resources into what we want, right? This context is rather important and it often, and I'll, say, I'll tell you this to you right now, when you're, when you're an undergraduate and you've gone through most of your life and you've been in school, you've pretty much done what you've been told, right? You're in school, you're going to graduate. At some point, you're going to walk outside the door one day and you'll have nothing to do except what you want to do. This is an interesting moment because it's, it's liberating and it's terrifying. And I'll tell you, because I've had this conversation with lots of younger people, and I had it with myself when I was your age. Sometimes, and the older people in the room might have some clue on this, or some of the younger people too, but sometimes you'll say, God, what do I want to do? I don't know. I don't even, uh, should I get in my car? I could drive that way. I could drive. Should I walk? Should I work in a job? Should I apply for that job? What can I do? And the thing you have to ask yourself is, what do you like? Right? Now, economists call these preferences. What do you like? Those are your preferences, right? Your preferences change. You meet somebody, you say, oh, I like those shoes, so now you've got new preferences. Or you have a fruit, I like that, I don't like that. Whatever it is, you have preferences. And those are what we're trying to meet here with economics. And economics is about what? What's one of the basic definitions of economics? Come on, you've all had more than one economics class. Maximizing utility for an individual based on what? Preferences. preferences, that's good. And can we all maximize our utility endlessly beyond satiation so we explode with utility? Constraints, I heard of constraints there, right? Maximizing utility subject to constraints, right? Essentially, getting the most bang for your buck, right? You've got this these many ingredients in the refrigerator, how am I going to combine them into a meal that I want to eat? So that is really what the economics is about, and the society that we live in tends to affect those economics. Sometimes the society will say, we need to subsidize rice because we want to make sure that people have access to food or rice, right? Sometimes they say, we need to subsidize cars because it's important that people be able to drive around. Those discussions actually are going to get a lot more complicated because there are other impacts from these subsidies. But I'm just trying to point out that there's a structure here. You go from one thing to the next to the next. You go from your preferences to the economics and to the politics. And there's a feedback loop, which is very, very significant. So in economics, we talk about scarcity all the time. If it's not scarce, we don't really have much to say. Okay? Climate change is a really big deal because the clean atmosphere used to be taken for granted, and now it's not. Right? I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1970s when you couldn't go outside because of the pollution. This is the deja vu moment, right, for China. 
And they, that's how California got crazy about air quality controls, right? They've, they've done a whole bunch of stuff that ended up changing things, and so now the cars are cleaner and the kids can run outside, right? So clean air was scarce, let's make an intervention. People have to pay more for fuel, they have to pay more for cars, they have to pay more to uh, do the things that are involving pollution, but we do that because we have a goal of having clean air. That's a trade-off. The opportunity cost, in a sense, is what can we do with, what else can we do with what we've got, right? You have an opportunity cost, you're here right now. You could be in bed. I think half of you would be, I would rather be in bed, right? Uh, you have an opportunity cost and you spend your money on uh, one thing, you could spend it on another thing, right? If I have a ticket to the show at 8 o'clock, and it cost me $20. And then my friend comes along and says, hey, uh, let's go uh, skateboard. Let's go skate. Skate, S-K-A-T-E. My native English skills are awesome. Let's go skate. What's the opportunity cost of skating? I hear you, I hear murmurs. What's the opportunity? Am I going to point at somebody? Somebody over here, this section, the quiet majority. Make it simpler. $20. What's, an, what's another opportunity cost? Time? Who said time? Time. What's another opportunity cost? The show. What's another op so that's, that's three opportunity costs. I think the $20 is a maybe, because that money's gone. That is a sunk cost, right? The show is definitely an opportunity cost, right? You can go to the show, you can go to the skate, right? And then, of course, there's your time, which is a little bit redundant, but that's fine, okay? So what we need to think about sometimes is what cost are we incurring, or where, where is the issue here? And... Um, you know, best thing, of course, would be someone gives you a $20 ticket, you hate the idea of the show, you sell it to a guy outside for $30 because there's a big line of people, and then you go skate, right? So that can happen, too. So that's okay. Um, where's my list here? So utility, and so the, the, the maximum utility is the worst word ever. I, I just read someone the other day, they were talking about the, why we're using this word utility. Someone's trying to be very definite. Utility, generally speaking, happiness. It's what you like, okay? But we'll use it, you, we're all used to it, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. So, the, but the, the, the other part of economics, which is really interesting, is that unlike, so physics, a, a lot of, so there's a lot of discussion whether or not economics is more like physics or more like biology. More like physics. You get a bunch of atoms in the room, you shake them up, and they all like interact, right? But they interact, on the one hand, in a fairly deterministic way, right? Because it's a physical interaction. On the other hand, there is a little bit of randomness, this Brownian motion. Things kind of bounce around randomly. But on the other hand, people are not that random. When you walk down the street and you're walking against a crowd and everybody's kind of like intermingling with each other, you see that there's this interaction, but it's, it's very uh, slight and it's, and it's very efficient in a sense, right? So people interact and biology has that aspect of, of interactions and randomness and things going on. But the, the little, little beast in the Petri dish doesn't have a really strong idea about what it's doing besides it's growing and eating the sugar, right? The problem with people is they think all the time about what they're doing. And that makes it very difficult to do, study people and get them to do something right. That's what economics is about. Economics is about people. And the biggest question you're going to ask yourself in life, if you don't already all the time, but by using economics is, if I do this, then what do they do? Right? Then what happens? And some people will say, well, that's game theory. Well, game theory is true if you live in a little box, right? That has a two by two matrix, and you and the person in the, in the box both know each other very well. In fact, you know each other's payoffs, right? And you know the probability of the moves, blah, blah, blah. Game theory is like, it's fun, but forget it, right? It doesn't work. There was that cute version of it in, in A Beautiful Mind uh, with getting the girls in the bar. Who saw that scene, Beautiful Mind? Anybody, a couple people? Okay. So. 
you know, there's three guys and there's three girls. If they all go for the cute, if all, all the three guys go for the cute girl, then the other two girls get ignored. They walk away. All three guys, it's a tragedy of the commons, right? Three guys, one girl, forget it. She has seven drinks and she's not interested in any of them. So, you know, that was game theory applied. Doesn't work, right? So you, you need to, uh, you know, keep in mind that humans are, are uh, much more flexible and much more unpredictable. This is just... Um, part of what's going on when we get into the economics, the politics, the political economy. So we will, we might use a little bit of game theory, but it's, it's, again, it's just so much math. And once you do it, you're bored, right? My girlfriend's like, I did it. I'm bored. I didn't learn any economics. I'm like, yeah, you didn't. So you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's something that will, that will, uh, pass over. What does it mean? A comparative advantage. Why do we trade? Why am I getting paid to talk and you're getting paid or you're paying to listen? Why is that? You are more efficient than most of us. Like, Hopefully. That's a dangerous question. I shouldn't have asked it, right? It's like, actually, I don't know. Why am I here? Right? But theoretically, I have a specialization of information about economics that I can, that I have accrued over 10 to 30 years, depending on your scale. I, 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 my first economic experiment was when I was a, uh, a kid and my parents gave me a uh, watermelon to sell on the street. And I was selling slices of watermelon for a quarter because I wanted to buy a teddy bear. And my costs of goods sold was, I used a verb, what was my cost of goods sold? Zero. They gave me the watermelon, right? That's a great deal. And I was making a profit of 25 cents a slice, right? I like this economics, right? So this is how I learned about economics from that early age. But if you learn about it, you think about it, then hopefully I can give you some information that's useful to you, given that you have all kinds of other specializations, right? Some of you are better at basketball than me. Some of you are better at driving than me, scuba diving, uh, mathematics, whatever it is, astronomy. You, you have your own specializations. The reason that we trade with each other is because it makes us better off. Sometimes we can go too far with trading potentially, right? And we'll get into those things about the resources about the environment. But this is the fundamental aspect of economic behavior. We are trading. I'm saying these things because I want to just reiterate the obvious stuff that's going to be very important when it comes down to talking about resources. Why is why are the Australians rich right now? I'm listening to answers from people from China. Why are the Australians rich? Where is it? You? Who said that? You? Or, yes, the China, Chinese people, directly or indirectly because of exports, are buying a lot of iron ore and coal from Australia, right? So Australians are rich from this trade. They're just digging up their continent, putting it on the ship, sending it over to China, right? Why do most American, or why do North Americans wear shoes that are made in China? Style, obviously, no. <laughs> Cheaper labor and uh, a, um, a cluster of people who are going to make shoes and shoelaces and the soles and all that stuff, plus the knowledge, right? North Americans can't even get back in the shoe business if they wanted to. They forgot how to make shoes, right? But the thing is, is that Japan was making shoes after World War II, and they forgot how to make shoes too, because they moved on to cars or whatever. So specialization occurs in these cycles. And, and if you go to China, it's like, have you, now, are you from China? Yeah. Have you made shoes? See, what's going on with you? I thought you were from China. <laughs> but, the, see, but the fact is, it's like you even specialize within, it's, like, it's not like all the Chinese make shoes or all the Americans like have wars or whatever. It's like, you know, you do different things, right? So even, you know, from a country, there's obviously these generalizations, these stereotypes, but countries are doing things in general, but there's lots of specialization, there's lots of things going on. And the key is when you get back to that arist. arist Aristotelian question of what do you like, what are your preferences, what, that leads to what is your comparative advantage. I'm teaching right now, right? That's my comparative advantage, but I like doing it. 
You might have a comparative advantage of jumping off buildings, but maybe you don't like doing it, right? So that's why we want to match these things together. You do, what you're, you do what you like, you do what you're good at, you're going to make a living, you're going to have a good thing, right? And that's why Australians are very happy about digging out holes in the ground, the Canadians with the potash industry or the oil sands, etc. So there are prices that we pay for things. The price that we pay, so the price for petrol now, gas, you guys call it gas or petrol? Gasoline? Yeah. Gas, gas. Everything is so American here, it's shocking to me. I'm from, you know, I'm from the States, I'm like, I come from the Netherlands, I'm going to Canada, it's like, it's totally different in the US, la la la, they, they have flags on themselves and everything like that. Totally different country, and everything's the same as the US. It's like, it's the US with a healthcare system, that's the only difference I've found. And confusion about this metric thing, right? So I'm, I'm like, I like the metric system, but sorry, like Canada fails. So, prices. Petrols, want, or gasoline, is, gas is a buck 40 a liter, something like that, give or take. Okay, now, a buck 40 a liter. Uh, bottom of the hill in Burnaby, there's a gas station. You're, you're low on gas. Here's the, here's the question. You're low on gas. Who, here, who drove here? Who drove here? Okay, some people have driven here. I'm, I'm not low on gas, I'm on the bus. Um, you're low on gas. Station at the bottom of the hill, a buck 50 a liter. Hmm. Can I make it to the next station? Is the question, right? Is it two o'clock in the morning on New Year's Eve and you've just passed two stations that have sorry empty signs, right? Or sometimes like these stations, they just shut at five o'clock and they're done, right? So you have to make a decision. The price is a dollar fifty, but what's the price of running out of gas? Pushing your car. I pushed my motorcycle once five kilometers along a highway. It was not fun, right? <laughs> a guy stopped with a, the with a motorcycle. He says, you're out of gas. I'm like, thank you. So that, and then he drove away. So what's the price of running out of gas? Like $1.50 is one thing, but there's a shadow price, right? The shadow price depends on you as a consumer. It really is your demand function in a way. I mean, there's I'm not going to use the word shadow in a very vague sense, but the demand function, your demand for gasoline on an everyday commute is $1.35, $1.40. Your demand for gasoline, I'm pushing my car, is $10 a liter. Please push my car with dead dinosaurs, right? So the price there will actually be a little bit subjective. And you might pass by that $1.50 station every other day, but today you might stop. But more importantly, for our class, there's two sides of the dollar fifty that we should we can use to illustrate most of what's going to happen in this class. Okay, that's the price to you, the consumer, right? What goes into that price? What's included in that price? Tax. What else? Transport. What else? Sorry? Labor. What was the other thing? Environment fee. Hmm. Labor. Question mark. Profit. What else? Huh? What did you say? Cost? More, I need a more, more words in front of cost. The cost of gas. What's included in the cost of gas? Resource. Let's call it the oil. We'll make it easy. What else? Refinery. Is that what you said? Who said that? You said that. Refinery. I'm going to put it over here. I'm running out of space. Oil, refinery, anything else? Storage. Storage? Sure. Pipeline engineers coming in. Shh. What else? Huh? Markup. We got, cap we got profit in here. I'm going to put capital. You have to pay for the gas station, right? Rent and so on, right? So, look. This is a, oil is a resource, right? 
The refinery is a, is a, a capital product. Profits, profits. Uh, there's, a different, there's different kinds of profits, accounting profits, economic profits, etc. Environmental fee, we'll get to that in a second. Labor and capital, those are direct input costs, transportation, storage, other types of costs. In the pro there's spatial costs, time, space, time. Very good uh, there. And tax is set by the government to do a couple of things. Number one, money, right? To get money. The government wants money, you're paying for gas, they'll take some of that, right? There is, whoops, here. There is a, uh, another idea of taxing, which is we want you to use less gas, so we're going to tax it to reduce your demand, right? Reduce your, reduce your quantity demanded, okay? We'll get into that in a little bit. But there's a big debate, a big discussion over whether or not that is the correct amount of taxes, whether or not the environmental fee is set correctly. It has to do with, uh, has to do with pollution, it has to do with congestion, it has to do with uh, uh, a global uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, it has to do with sometimes the process of, of actually uh, producing the gas in the first place, the oil, producing the oil, right? Do we worry about energy security or uh, uh, the water, water cleanliness in the Athabasca or something like that? So all of those ideas show up here in the price of the gas. Where did I go here? But the, but, if the, but the price, let's just say, if it's too low, it'll be too low because of which of these? Why should the price be higher as far as any of those categories are concerned? We know if the price of oil goes up, the price of gas, what? Goes up. Profits go up, the price of gas will go up. How easy is it to put the price, of, the, price of profit, the price of gas up to make a bigger profit as a gas station? Have you ever noticed this example? Where you've got 149 here and 148 here. Have you ever noticed that in gas stations? Have you ever noticed that when there's no gas station within seven blocks, it's 169? Or it's on the other side of the street. Oh my God, I don't want to turn on the other side of the street. I'm just going to go in here, right? So profits are hard for gas stations because they have very, very clear price competition. Gasoline prices may be some of the most competitive prices that any consumer faces, right? If you buy and sell shares or gold or whatever, but like when you go to the store and you buy milk, if you even look at the price of milk, it's not like you're going to walk out of the store and go get milk somewhere else, right? Because you're buying a hundred different things in the store. But you're actually driving down the road in your car and you only want to get one thing, gas. And that gas, that gas, you can see the price. You're not looking for, you know, it's a very simple, very competitive market. So the price, the, the profits in, in retail are almost, are nothing. They're about two cents a liter as far as I understand, last I saw. Environmental fee, of course, it'll make the price go up. It's a tax, basically, right? It's a tax or a different point. Labor and capital, can increase the prices. Uh, that's why if you're going to buy uh, gasoline in, in Vancouver, it's going to cost more than if you buy it in the suburbs or uh, farther suburbs, like Surrey, for example, right? Just because of the ground rent, right? Or the cost of labor there. Transportation and storage depends on how far it goes. Uh, and then there's the tax. So the, the question, the, the point here that I'm making is that the price includes many things. And the one that we're worried about in this class, really, is this one and this one. This is resource, this is the environment, right? The rest are going to show up. They matter, but we're, not, we're, we're going to take most of them for granted, okay? Um, now, why did you or anybody else drive a car here today? The bus is a pain in the ass. Yep. Okay. Or you live far, I mean, far away, changes and so on. Uh, why else did someone drive a car today? Um, 
Time. Time. Okay, that's good. That's a very logical reason. You guys are both in the time category. Why else? Anybody drive a car and like, you know, eat their breakfast and do their makeup and listen to the stuff and be warm, you know, the seat heaters and stuff like that? A little bit more comfortable. I rode my bike and I realized this morning that I was riding my bike that doesn't have a rear fender. And so I was like getting my ass wet this morning. I was like, not, you know, not a good way to start the day, right? So luckily I have dark pants, you can't tell. So there's a reason we do these things. But one of the reasons is, for example, you have a car. Right? Who here does not own a car? Okay, who here owns a car but did not drive it? So you guys came on mass trans or something like that, the bus? Okay. So you came in a car because of the time discussion. You guys or people who had cars didn't drive because it's either it's convenient or you don't want to pay for parking or whatever. You didn't buy your parking pass or whatever. People who didn't buy, don't own cars did you think, maybe I'll buy a car this morning and I'll get in the bus? No, you, like, you went and got on the bus, like, or you rode your bike or whatever, right? You, or you got a ride, right? So there's a real big difference in the way you see things depending on what you've already got. I've got a car, I've got the keys, it's got gas, I could do something compared to, I don't have a car, I have better make do, I better make that happen. And that, in some ways, in a nutshell, is the, 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 what we have in terms of the cars, somehow describes why we do things. And I'll tell you this, um, who here has lived in another city uh, than Vancouver and use a different form of transportation than you use here? A different form of transportation, right? Raise your hand. So when I came back here from Amsterdam where I rode a bike all the time, I wanted to ride a bike here because I'm used to riding a bike, right? Or if you come from a city where you're used to taking the bus all the time, or I used to commute on the train, you, you do things differently because that's what you do in that place, and you move somewhere else. Now, it's obvious that you do something else, but you know also if you want to do your old habit, when I saw Americans in Amsterdam trying to drive SUVs around and go shopping with a big cart, right? And the, car, the streets are like this wide. You can, you can fit two bikes side by side, but not an SUV, right? So they're trying to do stuff American style. It doesn't work very well. And you come, you come here, and I, I got on Venables. Does anybody know Venables, that street? You ever try to ride a bike on Venables? It's like suicide, basically, because it's like it's a four-lane highway, basically. So you have to change what you're doing according to local conditions. This whole category of local conditions are what, what we call institutions. Okay, institutions, I'm going to use in a very technical sense compared to what you might have heard, right? Think about the institution of marriage, right? Or an institution of higher learning. Do not think about a mental health institution, okay? Institutions are the formal rules and the informal norms that we use to conduct our affairs, right? Institutions are culture. It's why some of you are going to have a salty breakfast and some of you are going to have a sweet breakfast. It's why some of you are going to drive to school and some of you are going to take the bus to school. Or if you change cities, you're going to walk to school. Institutions, on their deepest sense, are culture. On top of our culture, which may last for, you know, as far as your, your religion or your people or your, or your whatever, might be, you know, thousands of years of culture. Or it might be, I grew up in San Francisco, that's my culture. You get culture somehow. It's what you believe, it's what you're used to. And then on top of institutions, we pile, or on top of culture, we pile a thing called a constitution. A basic law that applies to everyone. Some constitutions are written, some constitutions are unwritten. Right? If I, um, if I have... Uh, There's an illustration here. If I take out this sandwich, big sandwich, and I say, I'm going to share this with you, how do I share it with you? What's, break it in half. I don't do this and share it with you. Yeah. Right? Sharing is an institution. It's 50-50. You give a, two kids anything and say, share it, they're like 50-50. And it's even better. What's the, what's the better rule for, for sharing when you've got kids? What's the rule? 
equal, but how do you do it? You've got two kids, you want to make it incentive compatible. One person lives it and the other one decides. Right, you cut, I choose, right? So you divide it in half, I'll decide which half is which. That's an institution. Every culture has a version of sharing, right? It's very powerful. It's a powerful because when you try and go against it, boy, people really get upset, okay? And that's what I'm, I'm bringing this up because this is going to matter when it comes down to talking about rationing scarce resources because someone's going to say that's not fair, right? When it's not fair, then they go to their local politician and say, your job as a politician is to make things fair, and then you're going to say, okay, now we're going to change things, right? So that is what happens. When we get to the debate of climate change, the U.S. versus China on climate change, right? Or the Western world, the industrialized nations against the, the global south on climate change. What is the big debate? You have had 200 years of industrialization. You are wealthy. You have lights. We don't have water to drink. We don't have roofs on our houses. How do you expect us to use less energy when you've used energy for 200 years? That's not fair. Right? And the, the Americans will say, but we don't have to give you any money or compensation. We're already rich. So we don't do anything. Right? I mean, the, that's their negotiation point, basically. Like, what's fair is, or what's fair is, well, now China, I'm just using China as a, as a stereotype because it's, it's pretty important in this debate. Now China is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases. Should, you, should China reduce their greenhouse gases even though their per capita GDP is one quarter of the U.S. or one half of the U.S.? Right? You're putting out more pollution, so you should reduce your pollution, but you're poor. So do you have this debate? And both sides, in some ways, are correct. How do you divide that sandwich? This is essentially why not kidding, we are having, we're going to have a really interesting uh, 21st century, right? It's going to be very ugly as far as I'm concerned. And it's ugly because humans cannot collaborate, collaborate on these issues. In this class, we are going to be all over these issues. Resources are simple. The environment is complicated. And you should be able to think about these topics and come through this class and have a better way of engaging with the issues because actually one way or the other we're going to have to engage with them, right? When the sea level rises and your house has lost its foundation, you will have to deal with it, right? If your uh, vacation is canceled because the entire airport is uh, uh, under ice, which happened to me, I was going to South America, Dallas airport is where I was going through to go to Ecuador, 900 flights canceled. I'm sitting here in Vancouver airport, fuck. Right? I got, I'm not interested in hanging out in Vancouver for the next three weeks. I want to get out of here. Right? Luckily, the institutions of the airline said, ah, we'll reroute you. Right? Let's hope that the future is as flexible as the airlines when it comes to climate change. I have my doubts. But at least you'll be aware of what's going on and you'll be able to come through with some better ideas of how to handle things. Because ultimately, climate change is not a physics problem, a biology problem, it's not an ecological problem, it's our problem. We have created this problem and we're going to have to deal with it, right? Because the discussion, by the way, is, is where am I on time? I'm, I'm blagging away. Okay, the discussion is on mitigation, adaptation. What does mitigation mean? What does mitigation mean? What does it mean, the verb, to mitigate? To reduce, to, to, um, to reduce, to, to, yeah, reduce the harm in a sense, right? What does adaptation, what does adapt mean? Somebody, I'm going to point. Adaptation. Yeah, get used to it, something, right? So you adapt to, uh, so climate change, the discussion is about mitigating, it's reducing the greenhouse gas emissions that are going to cause uh, climate to change, or that are, are causing climate change, and adaptation is dealing with the consequences of changing climate, right? And that is going to be a major challenge that is going to, uh, uh, everybody's going to have to face, either directly because it's your job, and someone says, you're in charge of drinking water in this city, make it happen, right? Or it's going to be because something you experience. Your kids get, uh, you know, skin infection, 
because there's new parasites in the water because of uh, migration of uh, nasty things because of changing climate. Okay? We are going to experience that. Understanding how, what's going on is one thing, and being able to do something about it, engage in it, is another thing. That's really what we're going after in this class. So, that was a nice statement, but it's not the end of our time. So let's see where we're going here. Oh, institutions. Let me finish with institutions. This is actually handy. So institutions, um, we want to think of them as like a layer cake, right? The reason we think about institutions is because we want to know at what level do we have to deal with this problem? How deep do we need to go, right? On the bottom layer, we've got culture. Then we have got constitution. Then we've got laws. Then we have rules. Then we have transactions. There's a great paper on this that I can recommend to you if you're really interested in on it. Uh, a guy, uh, Williamson, who wrote it. He just described this. You don't need to know more than this diagram. Culture is very deep. Culture changes very slowly. Like a hundred year cycle kind of changes, right? Constitutions. Are, are, are meant to be fairly firm sets of laws that, that do not change very quickly. Canada's constitution is this loose thing that's kind of like a bit of English, a bit of whatever, but you know, Canada has this kind of basic law. Hong Kong has a basic law, which is a very interesting law. The laws are ways of, of adding more complications in terms of what's available, what's not available. You know, parking spaces laws. You know, you don't have a constitutional uh, 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 guidance on how to park your car, but there's a law on parking a car, right? Then you've got rules, which is like be nice to each other, or, or you know, uh, the, the stores closing or opening at eight o'clock in the morning. It's informal stuff. It's 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 not written into law, but it's you know, it's reasonably well understood. And then you have transactions, which is like you meet someone on the street, say, hey, I got an apple. You want to buy an apple? You know, and you're just making a deal. There's no there's kind of like these there's it's all ad hoc. You don't necessarily have a set of rules called, you, I own the apple and uh, you get the apple because it's Tuesday, right? That would be a rule. But a, a, a negotiation, a transaction is something that's much more informal. And these take place, you know, every couple minutes you get different transactions. This is every couple centuries, right? So the time scale is what's going up and down on these, on these relationship. What we need to think about here when we're doing economics, when we're doing policy-based economics, right? When you're doing your briefings and your blog posts, you have to think, this is a problem I'm worried about. This is a problem that has these costs. How can I deal with that problem? Well, I can deal with it at this level or I can make a rule, but does my rule contradict the culture? Right? If I made a rule today that to reduce greenhouse gas emissions of this class, everybody's going to ride their bicycle to class, then I would have a problem with the culture of Vancouver as well as, guess what, the topography. Right? You'd have to ride your bike up the bloody hill. I've done it. It's terrible. It's painful. Pe mountain bikers, I don't know what they do. Right? They are, they're into pain. Right? But if I said that, this is a great idea that we're going to do this in order to, to, to get this greenhouse gas emission reduction, you might say, that's stupid. I'd have a revolt. I'd never see you again. That tells us where the problem is, but it doesn't mean you can't find a different solution. If you want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, Maybe you can find one way of uh, eating uh, uh, less food, let's say, right? You just skip food altogether. And then you decide to not have lights in your house or whatever. And then you decide you're going to ride your bike all around town but not up hills, right? And then you decide you're only going to wear clothes that are used, that no new clothes anymore, right? So everybody can find their way of reducing emissions, reducing consumption, really. It's about 